Hello dear ones, it's Alice. I am of the stars and I thought I'd go into a little more detail about the nature of the relationship between the lower mental body and the higher mental body. And uh, so it goes like this. When we're small, before we reach the age of reason, when we are little children, toddlers say, there's a type of intelligence that we have that everybody loves. If you think back to your relationships with with children of that age, to the way that they uh, feel and think and respond to to our talking to them and our holding them and feeding them and so forth, you'll begin to understand the nature of the lower mental body. You may recall that a child of that age uh, needs to be told things again and again because its memory is not very great. It, it has some memory of things, especially things like sleeping and eating and walking and so forth, but not so much of a memory of the type of facts that grown-ups cotton to. Right? Things like dates and schedules and calendars and uh, a, a notion of timelines, for instance. It knows about Christmas because of uh, the feelings associated with Christmas, but typically doesn't know when Christmas will be, you know, what time, how, how long from now that might be. So it has no true notion of timelines and historical perspective. Um, although it likes to hear stories about that. It likes to hear about uh, what, how things were long ago and so forth. Um, also, it, it doesn't have much of an ability to, to reason things through, to, to work with logic. The left brain, I guess, is not very developed, but intuition is there. And so the right, that's the right brain, right? And so uh, very young children they generally can't work out problems of math and, uh, they, and usually do geometry. They can play music because music is a kind of a bridge between the left brain mathematics and the intuitive feeling world. They also don't have a strong grasp of what's socially acceptable and what is not, although from an early age, parents take pains to, to help them to understand what will help them to get along in society and what behaviors will not. Um, so, so that time before the age of reason, which is maybe eight or nine years of age, maybe a little different, um, before the age of reason, a child can be instructed in what I'd call character or morality uh, and also in the social niceties. And then after that age begins the formal education in things like uh, mathematics and uh, science and so forth. So, so you'll also recall how spontaneously the toddler laughs and how the toddler and how infectious that is so that if, if the toddler laughs everyone in the room might start laughing too and how lovable they are incredibly lovable how sweet and how how when they're how they reflect their moods without a social mask so for instance they get very angry everybody in the room knows about it right and it's it's it takes love and hugs and th that kind of thing too to calm them down and bring them back to, from tears to laughter. So contact, uh, physical contact, tactile stimulation are extremely important in, to the toddler's development. And, and uh, let's see what else. Uh, the tone of voice that we use is, to the toddler is also very important. Moms often have this down. They know exactly what tone of voice to use. Uh, to make the child understand that it's deeply loved so that he can get over its fears, to, to uh, admonish the child in case they see the need to do that in such a way that it's not destructive to the child's self-esteem but still prevents the behavior that must stop from, from occurring 
Yes. So, so moms have a well-modulated way of, of inculcating uh, social values and uh, um, morals and so forth. They, they do it in such a way that the child is not so wounded by the experience. Now, there's always room in every child's young life for a slip up on the part of the parents, is there not? That, and parents, without doubt, down here in this realm of duality and polarity, they're bound to slip up occasionally. And so th the minor instances where a parent, well-meaning and, and, and exceptionally well-intended, slips up during a, a child's very early youth, those are what we call soul wounding that the child carries. And so, now, so that's what I have to say on um, on the lower mental body, which we all experience in the first few years of our life. Then when the age of reason uh, is reached, the left brain kicks in, and the left brain typically because of uh, the approval, social approval, peer approval, and especially parental and authority, school authority, school teacher approval, the left brain has a tendency to take over and leave behind the feeling world of childhood. Uh, so the truth of the matter is, as the age of reason hits us, we become much less lovable. <laughs> And that is because we're hiding behind a social mask. We're, we're calculating what might happen in the future and figuring out what happened in the past instead of living in the moment. And, um, and we tend to delay our joys and not follow our heart because of our notion of timelines. Timelines are a very interesting and helpful comment. Uh, uh, concept for humankind, but not the kind of timeline that we um, we employ after we reach the age of reason. This is because the social construct of timelines is faulty, and I've discussed this in other blogs. But basically, we can pick whatever timeline we want. We can jump timelines into any time we want. We can merge old timelines that are of no value to us with awareness timelines that we really like. Okay, so the concept of a static timeline with karmic implications is not very useful now after the 2012 shift. Now we have all possible, the realm of all possibilities and we have the ability to jump to any alternate uh, timeline that we wish. Okay, but to get back to get to the poor child after the age of reason, stuck in the notion that there's only one timeline and that he or she has to take the consequences of his or her actions for the rest of his or her life, that they can, that they can come to uh, uh, decisions in the world that are incontrovertibly detrimental to them, that they can make fatal mistakes and that they'd better watch out or else. You know, some say, or else they'll go to hell. Others say, or else they'll be sent to prison. And others say, or else they'll be sent to uh, a mental institution, or else that, that they'd better see a psychiatrist or psychologist, or else that they'll be sent to detention hall, or else that they'll be flunked out of school, or all kinds of terrible things can happen to a child who doesn't do what he or she is supposed to do, right? So there's that fear, that constant fear of being uh, acting in the world in conflict with societal expectations, and this takes much of the joy out of the notion of following the heart. So the years go on for this young person who has reached the age of reason. Then the, they, they might be in their 20s or 30s or much later. They may remember uh, their childhood, their childhood way of being, and begin to realize that all of the neuronal um, learning, all of the wiring for the type of behavior and the, the ability to receive and project joy that they experienced in their early years still exists in basically in the lower intestine and in that area of the body as the lower mental body. 
Some call this re remembering, getting in touch with the inner child. It's the same thing. We begin to remember how we were and we begin to accept all of the spontaneity, all of the joy and laughter and happiness uh, and just the total joie de vivre of that child and incorporate it in their own essence. In this way, the left brain and the right brain join through the corpus callosum and the neurons of the of this area of the head and of the center of spinal column join with the like outer neurons the neurons of the of the intestine and the organs and so forth it all becomes awareness we become aware of all of these um, portions of our nervous system the autonomic nervous system the involuntary nervous system the voluntary nervous system we have a lot of way of describing this but basically all the nervous system becomes one and so sometimes people become aware of the child within the lower mental body at first on the clear plane in themselves or more likely in their significant other and they think that their significant other is actually talking to a third party when in fact in a pretty much a subconscious way at the borderline between consciousness which is the the higher mental body and unconsciousness which is the repressed area of the lower mental body and there's a an area of communication that you will hear in other people where their in can become through your tutelage or through their own uh, leap into awareness uh, of unified mind can they can become aware of what is going on in the lower mental body don't make the mistake of thinking that they're talking to someone else they're just coming to consciousness of their own second self their own better half as it were so I hope this helps in understanding uh, what many people are now going through uh, coming into contact with maybe the sulky child or the child throwing a tantrum or the little child hiding away and certain that he or she will never be loved and speaking to that child reassuring it that that love is there for that child that child will always be loved more than anything better than anything unconditionally loved and uh, just listening listening to that child as was not done very often in early childhood the mom just doesn't have time to listen to all that prattle you know and there's a very great deal of talking that needs to be heard from the lower mental body by the higher mental body so with patience and with love we can come to the fullness of understanding of who we are in the mental realms I ought to talk for a minute or two about what happened to me after I became more familiar with my lower mental body, my inner child. Uh, we had a few talks over the course of a few days and then a week or so later. And after that it seemed like the, uh, the uh, emotional affect that had been left over from childhood uh, like mellowed out it's as if the personality of the inner child changed and became more trusting and loving and open and then uh, then I uh, I began to sense more like elect electric tiny electric charges going off in my mm, colon and in my organs and wh when I called the inner child I would I could feel that electric energy pinpoint sensations of electric energy coursing up to meet in my heart there and and, and meld with my heart so uh, it became more of an less of an experience of a personality there uh, as in the beginning then of um, just a unifying of a field of energy that had to do with the, the um, electrical um, operation of the neurons in my body both in my head in my spine and in various places elsewhere So this sens sensation of all of that becoming united, I call uh, 
unified mind, the experience of unified mind. So one thing I found out about talking to my inner child is that the sound of my voice and the emotion I'm conveying are the most important things. And uh, so I, when I speak to my inner child, what I'm trying to do is convey a feeling of enthusiastic love, the kind of love that lasts forever, the kind of love that no circumstance will ever contravene, you know, the kind of love that a mom has for her young child, yeah, playing with her young child. And on the blog, I'm going to try to find some pictures of mom talking to her young child just to give a notion of the way that the voice sounds and the types of words that are used which are so effective in healing the, uh, the, the inner child, the child within, the lost children of the soul. And we may have more than one, we have a couple, or one that keeps changing, expressing new childhood wounding situations, you know. So it's a very interesting like journey, uh, taking the hand of the of the ch inner child and going on that journey of the upsets of early childhood. So yeah, let's see, a few ways of talking. You're the best little child. You're the sweetest little child. You're the nicest little child in the whole wide world. Okay, here's one. You can count on me. Ooh, you can count on me. Oh, no matter what, no matter what, you can count on me. So there may be those who just don't like that idea of talking baby talk like that or just don't have the experience. And so I have another idea for developing a friendship with the inner child that anyone in the whole wide world can do. Uh, when we were young, most of us enjoyed hearing um, nursery rhymes and, um, uh, you know, the golden books, the children's stories that our parents read to us. And that, and, and the inner child that's within our, like, uh, gut, you know, down our lower triangle, um, still loves and remembers those stories. So, so a fail-safe way of, of developing this relationship, this unified mind, is to um, is to find some children's books, some nursery rhymes and children's stories, and then just read them ourselves. Maybe right before bedtime, guaranteed to work over time. This is the last thing along those lines, and that is lullabies and songs from childhood. To buy some of those old CDs with the lullabies and with songs on them and play them right before bedtime. And I believe amongst all those tools, there will be something that's bound to work for you.